Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening. Welcome to this uh, webinar from all different parts of the world. Now, uh, we're just going to wait a couple of minutes as people join. Uh, so we'll just be uh, on screen for a couple of minutes as we wait. Thank you. We're just waiting for everybody to join, to come in, and uh, we'll start in about one minute. In the meantime, we would love to hear from you in the chat uh, where you're from in the world. Yes. Uh, th th thanks that you're already starting to introduce yourselves and, uh, and your organization. Thank you. Okay, let's start. I'm sure more people will be joining us. So, uh, welcome. The International Federation of Surveyors, uh, FIG Climate Compass Task Force, welcomes you to our second webinar of a four-year series on surveying and climate. So, this seminar is about moving beyond business as usual, redesigning our land and water and marine surveying systems to make them fit for purpose for climate action. So I'm Clarissa Augustinus, and I co-chair this task force with Roshni Sharma. Uh, and the two of us will be co-chairing the webinar today. We represent both sides of the task force, young surveyors and seasoned surveyors. Now, I am an FIG honorary ambassador and was the founding director of GLTN, facilitated by UN Habitat. And Roshni works for Frontier SI, an innovative Australian uh, geospatial company, and is on the Geospatial Council of Australia. Uh, and the purpose of this webinar <clears throat> is to have consultations and cons uh, conversations, hear from our speakers, share knowledge and build capacity to act and mitigate climate change impacts. The most important challenge of our time Thanks, Roshni, for a PowerPoint. <clears throat> we invite you <clears throat> to introduce yourselves and your organization in the chat and put in links of interesting items. I'll facilitate the first hour hearing from the panelists and asking questions. Please only pose questions to speakers in the Q&A. My co-chair, Roshni, We'll review the questions in the Q&A and will facilitate the final hour of the webinar. She will do Zoom polls and raise your questions to the three panelists. Apologies, the webinar is in English only and all questions need to be in English. The webinar will be 1.5 hours long and is recorded. After the webinar, uh, the recording will be sent to you for review and to share with others as we think through these issues of our times and about what surveyors can do to address the climate challenges. Next. 
The content, let's have a look at the content background. This webinar is about some of the latest thinking on redesigning surveying systems for climate resilience. Uh, next, the, it involves climate impact assessments and redesigning to minimize environmental impact. Uh, next PowerPoint. <coughs> Uh, are you able to move it, Roshni? Not yet. Okay. <clears throat> so what we look at... Uh, no, one back, please, Roshni, one back. Yeah, one back. Thank you. So this is about climate impact assessments and designing to minimize environmental impact, changing surveying systems to adapt to changing climate conditions and evolving technology, modifying data collection methods to pick up climate-related features, integrating surveying and climate data and increasing interoperability, developing tools to support climate adaptation and mitigation, and including for real-time monitoring, and developing scenario simulations such as digital twins to support decision-making moving from data collection to analysis and industry-wide capacity development. Next. So let's remind ourselves what fit for purpose means. The fit for purpose approach for land was developed in 2014, and we now need to expand it also to marine and water. <clears throat> for fit for purpose land is about the underlying spatial framework of large scale mapping being designed to manage current national and local land issues, rather than simply following more advanced technical standards. So we can see the key terms here is flexible, reliable, affordable, attainable. This means where the system can be rapidly established and within available resources, upgradable, allowing incremental upgrading, and participatory and inclusive. So it should support good land governance and ultimately fit within the national legal and regulatory frameworks. Next. So what's the structure of the webinar? We have four eminent speakers. After they are all introduced, uh, each will speak uh, for 10 minutes. After the presentations, I will ask the panelists some key questions from a climate angle, questions which they might only have partial answers for or no answers for, but which we need to be asking ourselves. Someone in the audience might have the answers. They will, they, this will be for 20 minutes. The final half hour of the webinar will be facilitated by Roshni. First, she will guide us to find out more about the audience and what you consider as key surveying and climate issues using Zoom polls. It will be followed by a panel discussion, picking up the questions and comments you have raised in the Q&A. So please start as soon as possible on that. As there are so many people attending this webinar, it will not be possible to hear from the audience directly, only in the Q&A box. So let's turn to our speakers. <laughs> Let me introduce you to our four eminent speakers for today. Dr. Jamal Brown will speak about coastal erosion in small island states and involuntary resettlement. He is the global focal point for housing, land and property in the UN Refugee Agency and has worked on disaster risk reduction in the Caribbean. Dr. Kwabena Asyama will talk on the valuation of unregistered customary or indigenous land and natural accounting. He is the chair of FIG Commission 8 and a lecturer in land economy at Knust University in Ghana. Simon Ironside and Assistant Professor Gordana Chakovkovich will talk about mapping plastics in the oceans and waterways. Gordana is at Banja Luka University in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and Simon is a cadastral surveyor with Land Information New Zealand and is a qualified hydrographic surveyor. They will draw from their work together for FIG Commission 4 on hydrographic surveying, also with FIG Young Surveyors Network. And as I said, we aim to end in 1.5 hours. So, right, let's get started immediately with the presentations. Jamal, the floor is all yours and you have 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Clarissa, and good day to colleagues. 
Good morning, good afternoon, depending on which part of the world you are at this point. Let me share my presentation. Okay, thank you. So the, the, the subject that we'll be looking at today is, of course, overarchingly, let's go beyond business as usual. Redesigning our land, water, and marine resources, sorry, marine surveying systems to make them fit for purpose for climate action. Of course, um, I'll be presenting specifically today on the, on the more granular theme of coastal erosion in small island states and involuntary resettlement. Now, very importantly, there are three critical pillars to this presentation today. The first is in relation to fit for purpose surveying systems. I think that goes without saying. The second is in relation to climate impact through coastal erosion. And the third is as it pertains to involuntary settlement, which I would like to take the liberty of framing today in the context of internal displacement, but perhaps more broadly in the context of forced displacement, given my substantive remit with UNHCR. Also quite very much related to that is the fact that there are a number of key global agreements and policy frameworks that this presentation is also guided by. The first is in relation to the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, the second is in relation to the Paris Agreement 2030. And the third, the Secretary General's Action Agenda on Internal Displacement. And I'll perhaps like to mention here also the COP, which is also quite relevant to this presentation today as well. Now, climate impact in the context of the, the of Caribbean cities, more specifically as it pertains to coastal erosion, um, is manifested um, by way of pronounced sea level rise, increased frequency of extreme weather events via hurricanes, tropical storms, storm surges, et cetera. And of course, by way of coastal erosion, quite relevant to this presentation today. Now, when we speak of Caribbean SIDS, we're speaking about those countries that stretch from the Bahamas in the North to Trinidad and Tobago, in the south, interestingly, both of which are extremely low-lying countries. In fact, just a few meters above sea level. Now, a common feature among Caribbean SIDS is what is considered to be a, a high coastline to land ratio, meaning that any rise in sea level is likely to have a disproportionate impact on agricultural lands, infrastructure, and populations located along the country's coastline. Now, very importantly, between 2004 and 2019, there was a notable or a marked increase in the intensity of Atlantic hurricanes and tropical storms. In fact, in 2004, when Hurricane Ivan hit Grenada, um, Grenada was basically ravaged by, by Hurricane Ivan, in fact, to the tune of approximately 26 billion US dollars in damage. And then, of course, in 2019, um, when Hurricane Dorian hit Bahamas, Bahamas was also ravaged, but there was a marked increase in the intensity between 2004, Grenada's experience with Hurricane Ivan, and in 2019 in Bahamas, experience with Hurricane Dorian. In fact, in the context of Hurricane Dorian, 70 persons died and 29,000 homes were completely destroyed. And why is this information relevant to this presentation? Because these are small island developing states with large coastal zones where 80% of the populations live within the coastal zones. So it goes without saying that the bulk of the impact was really felt within the coastal zone. Now, about a decade ago, I began, I began some research work in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and St. Vincent also happens to be my home country. Um, but 
this basically was the underpinning element of my doctoral research. And there were two communities that really stood out to me. Very importantly, the intention was never to look at coastal erosion. No, that was not the intention. It was about looking at disaster risk reduction more broadly. But what came to the fore in this presentation was the impact, the effects of tropical storms, storm surges, sea level rise in the context of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, two communities in particular. The first being what is called the New Sandy Bay Village. And you can see the image in the upper left-hand corner. And then of course, the, uh, some of the other images are from a community known as Georgetown, the former capital city of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Very importantly, there is a market impact on the, the coastal area within these communities. In some instances, it is noted that, that the coastline has receded by as much as 50 meters in just about two decades. Now, mind you, St. Vincent is a country of a population of just about 110,000 and a land size of 150 square miles. So one would imagine that in a country where 80% of the population lives within the coastal zone, losing 50, 50 meters of your coastline can have a devastating impact. In fact, one of the images there from, from, from New Sandy Bay Village, you have an aerial view of the sorts of the village. You can see how small that village is. Just imagine for a moment losing 50 meters from such an already small area. So what has happened in the context of St. Vincent and the Grenadines is that there has been quite a number of relocation initiatives, but also very much so coastal erosion has just taken land, taken property at will in the context of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. But what has been the impact on, on the local communities and the countries at large? Now, the, the idea of involuntary resettlement, I would rather not look at it from the standpoint of the overall procedures of involuntary settlement, but I would perhaps rather take it from the human rights standpoint, looking at it from the standpoint of internal displacement. Of course, in the context of the Caribbean, the disclaimer here is that involuntary resettlement, whether by way of eminent domain, um, compulsory acquisition, et cetera, is typically not done in an adverse or adversarial way to the extent that, that local communities or individuals are necessarily dispossessed of their properties. But more generally, more broadly, it is understood that if involuntary resettlement is not done in a correct manner, it will ultimately lead to, a, to what is known as internal displacement. So when we speak of internal displacement, we're essentially speaking about persons who are to a large extent forcibly displaced and there is no clarity on, on issues related to tenure security, et cetera. Now, another very important point is that the Caribbean's response to coastal erosion and climate impact more broadly has been manifested via various regional mechanisms. And I think here of one mechanism the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center. And very interestingly, um, just in April 2022, it was announced that a new LIDAR project was commencing to support decision-making as it pertains to disaster risk reduction initiatives, as well as climate change adaptation initiatives. Of course, this initiative is confined to the borrowing member states of the of of the Caribbean Development Bank, but St. Vincent and the Grenadines also happens to be one of the beneficiary um, countries under this project as well. But this also brings us to the broader question of the overall resourcing of the and redesigning of the redesigning and deployment of surveying systems for climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. Of course, in the context of small island developing states and the context of Caribbean small island developing states, but even further afield, what are the mechanisms that currently exist um, for the financing and resourcing of these initiatives? The first that I would like to point to is with regards to the facility for loss and damage under the UN Framework Convention for Climate Change. The second refers to more traditional mechanisms. Of course, they are within themselves 
complex commodities and complex financial instruments that have worked with some degree of efficiency and effectiveness. And I, I, I would like to point to, for example, social protection initiatives, contingency financing, catastrophe risk insurance, such as we would have noted in the, the Caribbean catast catastrophe risk insurance facility, um, catastrophe bonds, which can provide um, a certain amount of buffer um, for rapid payouts after disasters. But in the context of forced displacement, there's also the, the, the Internal Displacement Solutions Fund, which is framed in the context of the UN Secretary General's Action Agenda on Internal Displacement. And whereas we're referring here, in the, when we speak to, to um, involuntary resettlement, we're looking at it perhaps from the con in the context of internal displacement. I'd also like to reference here the Global Compact on Refugees. We're not speaking about the cross-border movement of people, but I think it is particularly relevant in mixed situations because initiatives that are meant to benefit refugees, the benefits that accrue to refugees in mixed situations will also accrue to, to internally displaced persons as well. And there are a number of opportunities that exist in this regard. So that in a nutshell is, is my presentation today. And I'm really looking forward to any questions or queries that colleagues may have with regards to the, the content presented here. So thank you and over to the floor. Thank you, Clarissa, back to you. Um, thank you, Jamal. Uh, thank you for taking us through a, a really interesting uh, understanding of, of how to work in SIDS, uh, coastal erosion. And now we are going to uh, go to uh, Kwabena, uh, who's going to give us some understandings of customary tenure uh, and the implications for climate. Thank you, Kwabena. The floor is yours. Hello. Thank you very much, everyone, and good morning. I hope you can hear me over there. Um, yes, your voice right. is so, up. Thank you. Great. So in this presentation, I'm going to give an overview of non-market values in land, especially focusing on um, indigenous and traditional lands with case studies from um, sub-Saharan Africa, um, especially from Ghana. Now, this presentation is um, a part of the manual on the valuation of unregistered lands, which was published by UN Habitat and GLTN in um, 2021, and it was co-authored by me, um, Dr. Mike McDermott from Australia, and Professor Peter White from University of Reading in the UK. So my presentation today is going to cover the um, concept of um, land tenure and unregistered land. So I'll talk about land, non-market values in land. And then finally, I'll delve into social, cultural, and natural capital. But then I will sort of um, um, sit this, sit these in uh, within two case studies, talking about the problem and then an example of um, of how this process is in practice. So, getting started. So to set the scene, let us look at this case of the Bui Dam project from Ghana. Now, the Bui Dam project was, um, the Bui Dam was constructed in 2008 by the government of Ghana with funding from, um, from the Exim Bank of China. And um, on these two maps, you see the situation before and then after. So it used to be a river, the Black Volta, that was supplying uh, um, water through a forest reserve you can see on the left hand side over here and there were three villages um, alongside this river and these were the villages that were resettled later and you can find them here in the resettlement township b so <clears throat> What was the situation on the ground? You had a mix of settlers and indigenous. There was a complex system of customary land tenure interests where you had the, um, the Paramount chief or the Omai Hene at the top, and then you had um, divisional chiefs under him uh, or headmen, and then you had family heads and uh, members of the family. So at the top of it, the, um, the traditional leader or the um, the uh, Paramount chief uh, held the Alodial title in trust for the people. And then the um, 
divisional chiefs and then the family heads held the sub allodial title and then the local people had tenancies and then use of frogs. The nature of the use of frogs being that um, people hold the land ad infinitum. Now, after the resettlement was done, something that was seen was that the um, the government took away the structural interest and gave the people um, leaseholds. Now, these leaseholds are 99-year leases, which are um, uh, after which the lands revert to the government. And so it reduced people's land tenure, perception of their land tenure security over there, even though their legal land tenure security increased because they felt like the government came to take our lands before and they, they can take it back again. Then um, you also had the replacement of um, sacred worship sites and um, limited compensation options. They also lumped up culturally um, different or diverse people in a one square kilometer uh, uh, radius of resettlement area in the resettlement township B. So all these problems um, uh, came up because one key aspect was not understood, the social values that people hold within their community. And so how can this be considered? Let us look at what we mean when we talk about unregistered lands and um, non-market value. So this is a snapshot of um, some three countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and the level of registration over there. And so we can see in Zambia, um, just about 20% of the lands there are registered in Ghana, just under 10%. And then in Kenya, you have about um, 25%. Now, most of the lands you find in deep blue, the larger unregistered ones are mostly customary lands. But on the larger scale, unregistered lands would uh, include lands that may or may not be registered by the state, uh, recognized by the state, but they may not necessarily be illegal. Um, lands that have not been registered in any sense, and these usually have no, no written contract, no deed of transfer, they have no title certificate, and they are usually um, communal in ownership. And this is actually one of the reasons why its valuation becomes difficult, as we see in the next slide. So, um, Borrowing from the UN Habitat's continuum of land rights, let us consider how this uh, unregistered lands link to market and non-market values. So on the, um, on the extreme left-hand side, we find the informal land rights and in the extreme right, we find the formal land rights. And with the informal rights, um, these are usually um, um, recognized through social networks um, uh, built on traditional rights. And these social networks may be both, um, may be familial, both uterine and then conjugal ties. And um, you also have somewhere in the middle, you have the administrative recognition and these rights are recognized by the states, but um, usually cannot be enforced and cannot be registered. So a good example is the community land rights that you had in Kenya um, uh, up until the nature of the community lands, land rights you had in Kenya up until 2016 when the Community Lands Act was passed with that uh, recognized community lands and allowed them to be registered. On the right hand side, you have formal land rights, which, and these are more, these are usually um, uh, registrable, they have market activities going on on them, and they, uh, they have more financialization. And this is due to the frequency of transfer on land rights, which give um, markets values and um, comparative values allowing these rights to be valued on the background of the evidence of the sales. Then now market value is limited to the concept of value in exchange. And so if there is no land market within an area, there is, or there is very little market within an area or little land mobility, it is very difficult to ascertain the market value. But then you also have other forms of value such as the fair value and then the investment value. The fair value in reflecting uh, specific markets and then investment value reflecting the um, value in use. Now, um, economically speaking, um, Unregistered lands are capable of producing both market and non-market values. Use values may be direct or indirect 
or option values. Now, direct values can be extractive such as farming, um, fishing or mining, non-extractive such as uh, habitation and then recreation. Direct use values are eminently quantifiable monetarily. However, in, uh, indirect use values include uses like water purification or enjoyment of a view, and option value arises because of future uncertainty. In other words, the release of value should uh, certain events occur. Indirect use values and option values are usually harder to quantify, and these are the ones we find on the left-hand side over here. And However, even when estimating uh, market values themselves, the market itself is not exact. And we are not dealing with fiscal quantities, but in probabilities of um, mental reactions, some logical, some emotional, in purchases and then in sellers. But then with non-market values, these include the existence values, altruistic values, so um, intergenerational and equity concerns, bequest values that is intergenerational um, um, equity concerns, then non-market values are much harder to quantify monetarily. So indeed doing so has been, um, has been criticized as um, taking a form of commodification that is extending market norms to values that do not pertain to the monetary domain. So um, for Property, social values include subsistence and uh, physiological development, self-identity, so um, people's social status and their personalization of property. You are also looking at um, social capital. This includes relationships between um, ownership and then um, uh, including relationships and ownership as a social sociocultural status. Then we're also looking at social equity and empowerment, political, that is uh, looking at political, gender, and social relations, and then psychological well-being, personal comfort, and then convenience. So land may form a part of a person's identity and um, communal land rights may foster connections between people and uh, between people and their physical environment. It relates to the needs and wants of uh, society and individuals. And an essential point in our context is that social values cannot be adequately con um, con captured by monetary um, uh, numbers. Ecological value is also intrinsic and is not usually reviewed in uh, it's not usually reviewed monetarily in market transactions, although markets in ecological systems and natural capital are emerging. So real property or natural capital in this context has considerable value in terms of ecological service provision. And this is enabled and influenced by biodiversity and biomass. These services are essential to the future of the planet. And these all include um, climate regulation, air, soil, and water quality improvement, uh, and uh, carbon dioxide sequestration. Now, these values may be um, consumed by current incumbents or retained as an option for future use by the um, future generation. Biodiversity has values that are difficult, if not impossible to measure in market prices. So some would argue that um, biodiversity is priceless, its value is infinite. But economists might argue that biodiversity in another commodity subject to trade-offs and substitution, one unique species could be substituted for another in terms of its utility at the margin. And marginal value here measures the change in the total value, but marginal value of diversity is problematic because of the inter, uh, interrelationship between the value of a single asset such as a river and the value of the related ecosystems or other natural assets. So this plurality of values, economic, socioeconomic, and ecological, means there is often a, di a di disparity between the market and accounting value. And uh, the accounting value here being the contribution of an uh, additional unit or property that would make the flow 
of um, that will make it to the flow of the socio and ecological benefits. So ideally, you, market you. value and uh, Sorry, accounting. Sorry, um, uh, maybe you can right? up some of these ideas as we go to the questions. Um, right. Okay. It, uh, we we are a bit short of time, so we really look forward to hearing a, a deeper dive right. in during the question time. Sorry about that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. No problem. So, uh, um, let's move to uh, our next uh, speakers. Well, uh, can we ask uh, Simon and Gordana to make a pre their pre their presentation on mapping plastics and waterways and oceans? You see my screen? Ah. Okay. Yes, yes I will. Okay. Um, we, uh, Gordana and I have uh, five minutes each, which is whereas the other two speakers had 10 minutes. So uh, I'm going to have to go very quickly so I so that we both get our time in. So let's start. Sorry. Yes. There we go. Um, Journalist Gordon Campbell wrote recently in an article on plastic pollution that compared to COVID and climate change, the threat from plastics seems like a low rent version of planetary disaster. Is it possible that the plastic drink bottle, the fast food plastic knife and fork, the plastic packaging wrapped around virtually everything we consume are really omens of the apocalypse? The answer, unfortunately, is yes. The effects of plastic pollution on the Earth's oceans are well documented, potentially catastrophic and increasing exponentially year on year. UN estimates suggest that over 75% of all the plastic produced since 1950 is now waste, with the majority of it discarded into landfills or dumped into marine environments. The UN Environment Programme has conservatively estimated that each year more than 8 million tonnes of plastic ends up in the oceans. That's roughly 15 tonnes of plastic entering our oceans every minute. 80% of all the litter in our oceans is now made of plastic. And by 2050, the World Wildlife Fund estimates that by 2050, sorry, without action, the World Wildlife Fund estimates that by 2050, there'll be more plastic in the sea, in the sea than fish by weight. Only 9% of plastic waste is recycled. It is difficult to recycle, slow to decay, expensive and polluting to burn, and breaks down into microplastics. Tiny particles that enter the food chain and cause harm to animals and potentially humans. We've all seen the images of fish and seabirds choking on plastic, but that unfortunately is just the tip of the iceberg. Microplastics, which are particles smaller than 4.75 millimetres in diameter, are present in the clothes we wear, the water we drink, and throughout the food chain. There are an estimated 14 million tonnes of them residing on the sea floor. And because fossil fuels are heavily used to create plastics and transport them to their point of sale, the climate change implications of the plastics problem are also not insignificant. This is an intolerable problem that needs immediate and far-reaching action to remedy. The Mac and the Plastic Working Group, uh, a combined initiative of the FIG Young Surveyors Network and Commission 4, uh, was formed in, in, in 2018 uh, to contribute to the battle against plastic waste. The question, of course, is how we as surveyors and spatial science professionals can best con contribute to the global battle against plastic pollution. Given our specific remote sensing, hydrographic surveying, project management, and overall measurement skill sets, measurement science skill sets. We have focused our efforts on better understanding the quality and type of plastic waste being transported in waterways before they reach our oceans. Rivers have been identified as a significant contributor to the plastic pollution problem affecting our oceans, with plastic waste predominantly concentrated on the surface and upper limits of water bodies, on riverbanks and along coastlines during the transportation process. 
This slide from CSIRO in Australia illustrates the waste transportation pathway, and it's from research undertaken in the Bay of Bengal at the outfall of the Meghna, Brahmaputra and Ganges river systems. Effectively, it's all coming from uplands and flows down through the waterways into the estuaries and the coastal areas, uh, and out into the coastal areas, and then from there it, it moves out to the to the ocean. So, so that's effectively the the problem. Currently, most of the available plastic waste data is obtained from empirical probability estimates at large scale, or from beach litter surveys, discrete areas of interest. Most beach litter surveys are undertaken in relation to a transect line or chain and offset for the surveyors among you, using international beach survey classification standards, which attempt to ensure consistent quantification and characterizations of the litter found. These types of surveys are time consuming, labor intensive and confined to small areas. A slide from our friends in, uh, at Green Hub in Vietnam illustrate the, the traditional beach survey process. However, it is worthwhile noting that differences in the international beach survey classification standards and the fact that the accuracy of the survey data is dependent upon the skill of the observer makes the integration and comparison of beach survey data difficult. Remote sensing data combined with artificial intelligence artificial intelligence algorithms and GIS tools has the potential to overcome current plastic mapping limitations and provide a long-term and resource efficient solution to the mapping and monitoring of plastic waste. However, there are significant gaps, or there were significant gaps, there's not now, uh, in our understanding of the spectral signatures of floating plastic, representing a major challenge to the use of remote sensing techniques. Although UAV orthophotos can provide suitably accurate data for mapping of floating plastic, most techniques rely on visual interpretation and manual laboring. So in considering these limitations, we wondered whether deep learning algorithms could be the solution to extracting floating plastic data from UAV orthophotos, enabling the differentiation of plastic type and determining the relationship between spatial resolution and detectable plastic size? Our research has found that the answer is yes. We have successfully developed a method to detect, extract, and classify floating and land-based plastic as small as one, uh, one centimeter squared from UAV orthophotos using deep learning algorithms. Well, Dana will now share with us how we do it. So I'll stop. Thank you, Simon. As Simon said, I will try to briefly explain the solution that we came up with uh, in order to deal with, with this problem. Uh, taking into account the minimum size of the plastic debris that Simon presented on his slide, uh, through traditional beach survey methodology, the ultra high resolution images is needed. In the recent year, UAV platforms in combination with the structure from motion algorithm have been recognized as a cost-effective alternative for the acquisition of geospatial data with high uh, spatial resolution. Although technology development enabled the fast and effective acquisition of the large amount of the geospatial data, the processing and interpretation of those data are still challenging, and uh, automatization of processing procedure is needed. Recently, artificial intelligence has been uh, widely used for these purposes. Uh, segment, semantic segmentation of floating plastic pieces from water bodies with ultra high resolution remote sensing images was based on the, uh, is based on the convolutional neural network that provided state of the art accuracy. So we used them in this approach. We used end to end semantic segmentation model based on UNET architecture, which has ability to work with very little training data and provide precise segmentation. Uh, UNET has symmetrical encoder decoder architectures, as you can see on the slide. The encoder side uh, effectively uh, extracts the uh, pixel information within, while decoder aims to extract the plastic from the future map. For the encoder side, uh, in this study, we use ResNet 50 architecture, which 
which was providing the higher accuracy among tested. So the aim of our research is to fulfill need for efficient and rapid estimation of plastic pollution by developing the methodology for automatic plastic detection. The overall model for detection of the plastic debris is in real time is presented on the slide, and it's completely based on previously discussed technologies. The model uses different uh, sensors, such as board view images with a spatial resolution of 30 centimeters, RGB and multispectral UAV data, and in situ plastic data. To gain deeper insight in the possibility of the mapping plastic uh, using the proposed approach, we conduct several surveys in the different scenarios, including clear um, deep water lake, unpolluted one with artificial targets, as you can see on the slide. And the second one is a real case scenario, which represents confluence of two river system, which is unfortunate, unfortunately uh, polluted. Totally seven survey, UAV survey was conducted using UAV equipped with the RGB and multispectral camera. And the high uh, flight height was from uh, 12 to 19 meters, while spatial resolution of the created data was between 4 and 30 millimeters. Totally three uh, different algorithms uh, was trained. Uh, first one is the model for detection of the floating materials on the water surfaces based on board view images. Uh, second one is the model for detection of plastic uh, pieces. Uh, and the third one is for classification of the plastic debris type. Uh, on the uh, left side, you can uh, see the results of the detection of the floating debris based on board view two images. Uh, as you can see, algorithm is uh, capable to accurately detect floating debris, but due to uh, pixel size, uh, we need uh, more detailed uh, images or a higher resolution to the, to deeper for deeper understand. The basic principle, basic aim of this uh, algorithm is to provide us uh, ability to detect hotspots. Uh, after that, we then uh, examine the relationship between image spatial resolution and the size of the detect detected plastic. The result shows that the algorithm needs at least one pure pixel uh, for detecting plastic on the water surface and at least two plastic, pi uh, plastic pixels to detect uh, the debris uh, underwater. Uh, the visual inspection of the results shows that the location of the plastic pieces were accurately detected, but some plastic pieces on the border were misclassified as the surrounding glass. Uh, no difference was observed between performance of the model between grouped or the single plastic and also uh, algorithm accurately detect the plastic in the shallow waters. Um, so uh, this is closer uh, look. Uh, we use uh, this one is was based on the auto photo with uh, spatial resolution of three centimeters, but we use one centimeter auto photo uh, to classify uh, different types of the plastic. The results are presented on the slides. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, the algorithm is capable to identify and quantify plastic objects with high precision, including four major classes, uh, plastic bags, plastic bottles, food containers, and food wrapping. Uh, in order to sum up, uh, the main benefits of our model is the rapid creation of accurate maps of the plastic. Uh, the processing of UAV data is completely automating it and in near real time. Uh, it provides a map of the plastic, identification of type and dimension of the plastic items and area covered by plastic. So it can be used for detection of the floating or plastic pieces on the beach. In, in, and it can... Um, provide accurate information which is needed for stakeholders dealing, dealing with cleaning campaigns, but also it can be used for monitoring sustainable development goals indicators specifically target 14.1 uh, to prevent and significantly reduce marine pollution of all kinds. Thank you for your attention and we are looking forward to your questions in the Q&A session. So I said back to you. Great, thank you very much. And now we've come to an end of our presentations uh, on moving business beyond business as usual. As you can see, it's a fairly wide ranging. And uh, now I'm going to ask the panel some questions. So please, just as a reminder, put your questions in the chat. We see them coming in so that Rushdie can line them up for the next session. Um, now, um, I'm going to put some questions to the panel. Remember, guys, that... Um, 
and, and as the Climate Compass Task Force, we, we focused on building knowledge. Not everybody has the knowledge. <clears throat> so this is about strengthening communication. Um, it's about asking questions which uh, are hard questions. Uh, it's it's about uh, maybe not everybody has the answers. So we have four presenters, and these will be grouped in five minutes uh, slots. Um, and um, I will mix up the speakers, starting with Jamal, then Simon and Gordana, and then Kwabena. Um, please feel free to answer the questions from a global and national or local perspective and within any geography or sec surveying sector with as practical focus as possible, drawing on your case studies. And uh, Kwabena, we, we would really be keen to hear the, sorry, the rest of your presentation uh, if you want to give the, the pieces to us that we're, we're starting to emerge. Um, so if you but if you're not ready, uh, please don't feel free to, to to answer all the questions. Maybe nobody has all the answers yet, but we just need to keep asking them. So remember that surveyors are absolutely critical to the delivery of all the three Rio environmental goals, including like, for instance, COP28 that starts tomorrow um, and for the future of the planet and people. So using your presentations and going beyond it, I'm going to be asking these four questions of all the panelists. How do we need to redesign to minimize climate impact and address climate change? What are the legal and ethical issues we need to address when redesigning? What new fit for purpose tools are needed for climate resilience? And what are the capacity gaps? Right, Jamal, give us your thoughts. Yes, thank you very much, Carissa. Um, very, very important questions. And, um, you know, as it pertains to the first question of how do we how do we redesign um, to minimize climate impact and address climate change? I think the, the first element of the redesign has to be as it pertains to our, our overall business model, because a significant amount of work has been done in actually developing a lot of these tools. I don't think that there is any shortage of technology tools, approaches, et cetera, a significant amount of work has been done in that regard. But in many instances, there is a gap and the gap is in relation to the extent to which the technology has actually been diffused into particular societies to address um, you know, issues around the understanding of disaster risk, strengthening disaster risk governance, you know, et cetera, um, facilitating disaster risk reduction and, and, and climate change adaptation more broadly. So I think that the redesign is not so much from the standpoint of the actual technicalities of the tools and approaches available to us, but more so in our overall business models. How do we ensure that our packages, the solutions that are on offer, the, the, even the pricing structure, are, structures are more aligned um, with what is required from a climate change adaptation and a disaster risk reduction standpoint. Of course, there are quite a number of legal and ethical um, considerations that must be applied as part of that redesign, um, redesigning of surveying systems. And of course, you know, from the standpoint of do no harm, we need to ensure that, you know, any advancement as advancement as it pertains to geospatial technology, surveying systems, et cetera, do not promote, for example, expropriation of lands, government expropriation of lands or dispossession or forcible displacement of persons, I think that is absolutely critical. And even where the documentation of tenure is concerned, we must be able to um, respect as best as possible. For example, um, where there are no um, traditions of the individualization of tenure, whether in customary context, et cetera, um, where use rights are being, are being allocated, we need to ensure that the, that, that the tools that are applied in those instances are applicable. And as it pertains to the, the, the overall capacity gaps, um, as I would have mentioned a while ago, it, it largely comes down to the diff diffusion of the technology um, into local and national systems. I think that is where the greatest challenge really exists. And as it pertains to what new fit for purpose tools are needed for climate resilience, there are two that really come to mind. The first is in relation to those technologies that facilitate spatial analysis and that therefore support decision-making at the policy level. And the second is with regards to the actual disaggregation of data down to the household level. 
I think surveying professionals play a critical role in that regard. But Clarissa, thank you for those questions. I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you, Jamal. And uh, let's immediately go to Gordana and Simon. Gordana? Will you be answering the first two and the second two? Or... Sorry, Gordana. Um, okay. Um, to, uh, thank you for the question, Clarissa. Uh, in order to uh, fit the, uh, to perform, develop, redesign, and uh, minimize climate impact and address climate change, I think that we uh, need to incorporate advanced technology and uh, uh, methodologies to address those, the, those challenges. As we know, the understanding of the spatial and uh, temporal changes is the environment is the vital for that and I think uh, we are like um, the main profession that uh, could, could answer those questions where something is when something is and what it uh, does mean so uh, just spatial technologies are important aspects or uh, for any uh, uh, phase of the disaster risk reduction and if we take for example uh, I don't know floods. Uh, we can um, make the we can make the the tools that are fit for the purpose for risk assessment and mapping. For example, we can uh, use lidar data to assess to create a, a digital digital elevation models. Uh, we can use a, a sonar to uh, detect river beds, which are crucial for. Uh, assessment of the risk, and we can also provide uh, maps of, of disaster risk, uh, which is uh, really um, uh, um, easy to understand and uh, can also uh, involve involve um, a general uh, community uh, community to to actively participate. Also, we can uh, use those data during the the uh, crisis during disasters. Uh, to uh, to emergency response, response such as the resource allocation or identification of the priority areas, but we also can uh, provide, for example, escaping routes or um, provide to citizens up and and uh, responders uh, the updated data uh, about um, the, for example, streets that are flooded that we can uh, go to. Uh, and after disasters, we can provide the uh, damage assessment. Um, I think that we uh, we have uh, the data. Uh, there is a bunch of the data currently created, but uh, I think we we should uh, pay more attention on uh, analyzing those data and extracting information that are really important for decision maker makers in order to uh, to use those data. And I think those are uh, we can in that uh, specific region we come to the cap capacity uh, gap, which is in my opinion uh, limited expertise in the ge geospatial technology, but also in the deep learning or uh, algorithms for automatic analysis of the, those data to provide data in time, and also uh, limited ac access to advanced um, uh, geospatial technologies and tools. And I would. Uh, Say that I agree completely with Jamal. We need to uh, to update our, our portfolios and uh, just uh, um, put data and technology that we already have that we already uh, use, but in the context of the climate change, meaning that we uh, can provide exact information that is needed to decision makers in order to uh, to provide uh, better better um, uh, answer to the to the climate uh, to the climate changes. So. Uh, I really think that integration of geospatial data, geospatial technologies, uh, geographic information systems, uh, and cartography can um, be uh, uh, fitted to the to this purpose in order to provide better protection uh, and better response. I hope that Thank I addressed you. all your questions <laughs> in one. Thank you very much, Godona and uh, Simon. Uh, yes, I also agree with uh, Jamal uh, Jamal's point that um, we don't need 
in terms of surveying, in terms of the technologies we have, we don't need to redesign anything. We we've pretty much got it all. The technology there, as Gordana says, I think um, I think it's a question of what the surveyor, uh, in in terms of minimising climate impact, I think it's it's all about um, resist uh, resilience building. I think it's building back better. Um, I think it's in response to in response to disaster as well as in response to earthquakes. Certainly, from my own experience as a surveyor in Christchurch um, during in the aftermath of the um, of the earthquakes we had here, um, if we didn't have GNSS, we would be would have been in big trouble because of the 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 the, um, the X Y Z movement that we had ground movement that basically threw our, our cadastral fabric completely out. So we we needed a, we needed to be using those sort of um, we need some precise, precise measurements to 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 work there, um, but but in any response to a disaster, we need to look at the infrastructure that, has, as Gordana says, has been has been damaged. We need to give the engineers and the decision makers um, the information they need to uh, get get things moving in the short term, but in the longer term to make sure that resilience resilience and um, and uh, it, it, yeah, is but we are building back a better, you know, better than we were. Um, the ethical issues, you know, are going to come again, as Jamal has talked about, in terms of uh, retreat. Um, you know, the, you look at the SIDS, uh, the SIDS in the Caribbean, the SIDS in the in the South Pacific, similar situations. You've got um, you've got rising sea levels. You've got limited land, and you know, what do you do? Uh, here in New Zealand, uh, there are areas that we that we are seriously having to look at low lying areas that have been flooded from time to time that we will have to look at ultimately retreating from. So it's a question of how that's done equi equitably and fairly, as Jamal has also said. Um, and surveyors are very uh, surveyors are there in terms of giving the giving the the geospatial um uh, you know cadastral surveying uh, and, uh information and advice that then informs the decisions that that policymakers will need to will need to do so i don't think okay. that from a surveying perspective we need fit for fit for purpose tools i think we've got the tools i think it's how we i think it's how we use them and where we use them and um and i agree with gordana in terms of the the the, the capacity gaps and i think that's that's sort of my my two cents worth, if you like. Thank you, Simon. Okay, Quibena, over to you. And and really, I'm looking forward to. Sorry about cutting off your presentation, but we're looking forward to getting the details. Thank you. Sure. Uh, yeah. So in answering your questions, um, I just put everything together. So with uh, redesigning uh, to uh, minimize climate impact and address climate change. I, I feel like uh, when we talk about redesign, it, it, it requires a holistic approach in a sense that climate issues are very, though we see, um, we talk about it in the large macro, uh, as a large macro issue, it's actually a micro issue that affects individuals, social, economic, and their environmental aspects of their lives. And so it's, it is very important that the new approaches um, or the redesign that we look at reflect these three aspects of um, people's lives. And I'll talk more about it when I mention the third question. Um, the legal and ethical issues, I think these would center more about bringing the ability to bring in extra legal aspects of the economy that I was talking about before. So talking about people um, who have um, uh, social recognition of their lands and then administrative recognition, because these aspects usually fail uh, uh, most of the economies in the global South. Now, when we talk about new uh, fit for purpose tools that uh, I, I see that we have to consider both the social and cultural needs of their users. Conventional um, um, surveying, cadastral surveying, land surveying, and uh, valuation surveying tools have lots, long sat in the ambit of the social development of Western Europe. And so these tools should hence be able to be redirected to focus on the social and cultural context of the areas where these tools are going to be used. Then in terms of um, capacity gaps, I, I saw a question in the Q&A that um, 
talked about something like this. And um, when we get to the Q&A session, I think we can uh, talk about that more. But then <clears throat> capacity gaps would be in terms of education and training of, uh, from my perspective, um, as evaluation surveyors in the context of the global South. You find that today, very little consideration is given to um, is given to non-market values, the sensing of non-market values when uh, uh, in the training of valuers. And so, especially in the valuation of Kasumi lands, you find that these issues are usually not talked about. And so there's the small aspect of um, um, the value that relates to the market is usually what is reported, but then other aspects of the value are usually not much um, considered. Thank you very much, Clarissa. Thanks very much, Krabina. So um, we've had some very interesting conversations. And um, I'm now going to immediately pass over the uh, chairing to Roshni, who's going to take us through the, the next half an hour. Roshni. Thank you so much, Clarissa, and, uh, you know, amazing presentations. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Jamal Brown, Simon Ironside, uh, Dr. Gordana, and Dr. Kwabina uh, Asiyama. Wow. I feel like I have learned so much in the past hour and I'm really looking forward to diving into some of the Q&A here. Just before we do that, I'm going to um, ask you if you have any questions, please do put them into the Zoom Q&A chat. And uh, we are a community here and we absolutely recognise that the wealth of knowledge that we have doesn't come just from our speakers, <coughs> pardon me, but from those attending in the audience as well. Uh, it is a network, an ecosystem that we have here that allows us to come together as surveyors who are interested in and uh, concerned about the climate crisis to be able to uh, look forward for solutions and be able to, you know, make the impact together. So what I'm now going to do is uh, put on screen a poll. So for all of our attendees, this is the time that we are looking to get you engaged here. What, um, what the process will be is for you to, um, you'll have a box that should be on your screen in the next few seconds. What will happen is you'll be able to uh, scroll on the right hand side of the poll. Um, and you'll have three questions. So the first question is, which sector are you from? And the second question is, what are your areas of expertise and interest? And the third question is, what are your climate related interests? We'll be able to see from these results, um, what is it that you are specifically looking to understand more about? What sorts of people are you looking to hear from and network with in future webinars and seminars and at the task force meeting that we have coming up in February? And also to understand what are the gaps that we can aim to try to fill through this task force? So the things that we do, the activities that we do in the task force. So if anyone has any questions or is having technical difficulties in answering the poll, please do put them into the chat in Zoom. And a reminder again, that if you have been inspired and if you've had, um, if, if your thoughts have been provoked by the excellent presentations from our speakers, please do place your um, questions into the Zoom, Zoom Q&A box. Likewise, if there are articles that you may be aware of or if there are ideas that you have, um, please put these into the Zoom chat box. And if you would like to share your own LinkedIn profile um, 
links so that you can network with each other, uh, all of the attendees on the call as well, please feel free to do that again in the Zoom chat and we'll reserve the Zoom Q&A box for questions for our speakers. We have a couple of juicy, exciting questions that have been shared already, exploring topics such as cybersecurity. Um, so please do place your questions for the speakers there. As we are progressing to complete uh, the poll that's up on your screen, do remember as well to scroll on the on the um, scroll bar that should be on the right hand side of your screen to ensure that you can access all three of the questions. And so while that is um, while, while you're completing the poll, and thank you, we have a lot of you who have already completed it, I might um, ask our, ask some of our panellists um, some of the questions. So, Corbina, I know that you are a very keen science communicator. You're very interested and very passionate about how we can convert technical information into um, simple, clear messaging that is accessible and understandable by the directed audience, whether that is students that you are teaching in your lectures or whether it is the average person on the street. <coughs> Pardon me. We've got a great question here from Nathan Hazelwood um, about how we can convert some of the highly technical information that we've covered from not just yourself, but the other presenters as well into a, a simple way, a manner that can be easily understood by the average person on the street. What are your thoughts on this? Um, I, I, uh, th this is a very interesting question because it, it reminds me of um, what happened after I wrote my first uh, journal paper. And um, one, a senior colleague encouraged me to write a magazine article from it. And so I, I converted it into, into a magazine article and it was published in, in um, GIM International, GIM International. And I think about six months later, a classmate of mine saw me and then he was just like, hey, I've, I've seen you writing some sensible stuff. <laughs> and so my reaction to him was, oh, you wrote, you read my journal paper. It's like, oh, no, 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 I wrote, I read this paper from, from a magazine. And it was just um, 600 words, okay? So um, the, what that taught me was that, yes, a, a lot of, you might have people in your field reading um, the technical um, um, papers that we write, but then it is important for us as uh, technical people, as scientists, to sell our messages ourselves. Um, a couple of years back, there was this um, um, newspaper article about the health benefits of wine. And when they talked about the journal paper itself, the journalists had just picked one sentence from the journal paper and then run with it. And so when we are talking about climate science, it's a very, very technical um, um, area where people have wild imagination about it. So it's quite important for we ourselves to take the step to write, to sort of write other articles after we have published our findings into the um, into the scientific world so that the man on the street can also understand what we are talking about better. Thank you. Man or woman? <laughs> man or woman, sorry, <laughs> the person. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so... That those are really great points. There's a, a another question here, and I do apologize if I um, don't pronounce your name properly. We've got a question from Muris Murescik uh, uh, for Gordana about saying that as a witness of major climate changes in Bosnia and Herz 
Herzegovina, I'm so sorry, and beyond, what are our chances of educating the public about the importance of our work? This flows on from what uh, KB has just spoken about in terms of choosing our audience and simplifying our messaging. Um, Gordana, over to you. Thank you for a question. Um, I think the first step would be uh, edu uh, education of, of, uh, of surveyors in, in terms of how we present the, the data and the results of, of our work. We, we need to put ourselves there as a crucial factor for, uh, for this specific uh, this specific area. The second one is uh, developing open source tools. For example, if we develop some uh, uh, geo portal where we will publish uh, all relevant data, uh, for example, for the flood, if we develop 2D or 3D uh, geo portal where we will uh, publish, for example, uh, uh, flood risk uh, risk maps, and uh, if we uh, do visualization of those data properly so the uh, regular person can go there and access those information on a regular basis and uh, can understand uh, those data i think that uh, general public will uh, gain more uh, more insights on uh, how efficient we uh, can uh, how efficient the information that we deliver uh, can be, for example, if we are uh, talking about what, if we are talking about uh, 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 response to the what uh, as a disaster, if we uh, have a geo portal where, where we can um, uh, uh, where we can publish the current uh, status and which uh, streets are flooded, then and if we uh, make the services that can optimize their routes for escape, I think uh, the uh, the people would be. Uh, very, um, very amazing. Uh, uh, those information would be very uh, useful uh, for uh, regular people, but also for for uh, responders that are uh, involved in the uh, in the disaster response. So, um, moving to to digital technology, moving to to uh, providing a good visualization methodology methods that uh, also integrating 3D can really help in better understanding of, of real world in, in, in their representation in the uh, uh, digital system. That, that's uh, really very insightful, Godana. Thank you. It, it flows on really nicely to a question that we have from Pierre-Francois Blin. Uh, and uh, Jamal, I'll ask you to respond to this, please. With LADM2 moving towards cadastral management of hydrospatial zones, how is the cybersecurity of geodata being anticipated to secure these high value zones? Yes, thank you very much, Roshni. I think this is a beautiful question. Um, in fact, you know, I, I wanted to answer Kobena's question as well, but I'll just go directly to this one. Um, you know, you know, as I would have mentioned earlier, a lot has to do with the extent to which the, the technology has really been diffused into respective societies. But more broadly, and considering those societies where the technology has already been diffused, and I think here of the cybersecurity consideration, um, I've seen quite a number of instances, particularly in the context of my remit, where, where the sensitivity and the security of cadastral data in, in conflict zones in particular is, is of the premium. And I think here, for example, to Ukraine, um, where, where the sensitivity of the cadastral data is of a premium, um, the importance of having um, blockchain technology, for example, um, the, the efficacy of that has really, really come to the fore in, in that type of context. The same applies um, in the context of high value, whether it be topographic data, bathymetric data, or, or cadastral data. Once the data is high value, then ten years, then sorry, cybersecurity becomes absolutely critical. And we've seen quite a number of instances where blockchain technology has been used to good effect, um, um, not just in the overall protection of the data, but even in in in, in facilitating um, um, post disaster recovery of data, um, as well as you know in in post conflict um, scenarios as well. So I think the technology is there. Um, the question is to what extent 
has the technology been diffused into certain societies? Because I can assure you that that the technology does not necessarily exist in the context of the Caribbean, at least from the standpoint of it being applied um, within the national cadastral systems or, or for the protection of bathymetric and, and topographic data. But I know in many developed world contexts um, that that cybersecurity consideration has already um, um, been considered um, by, by the, the big players. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jamal. Um, I've got a question here for Simon as well. Um, when designing a mapping approach for plastics in the ocean, what are the key aspects that can make it affordable to developing countries? So, you know, we've we've spoken in this conversation so far about how we can secure our data, how we can communicate broadly. But another key aspect to a lot of the themes that we've covered in the presentations today has been equity, how we can make uh, these technologies and approaches accessible, not only to developed nations, but also to developing countries. Over to you, Simon. That is a very good question, Rothney. Uh, and unfortunately, developing countries, particularly uh, in Southeast Asia, but also in Africa, I think, are bearing the brunt of this plastic pandemic. Um, and unfairly so it's probably in, in most instances the, the the problem doesn't doesn't begin in the uh, with them but it through uh some some twist of geography it, it ends up with them um and they and governments have 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 limited budgets and they have a lot of competing demands in those budgets so um as you say um it's a question of how it can be done equitably um what we what we are doing, Gordana and I, in the mapping the plastic um, space, as we were talking about, is effectively our our surveys are really based on on UAV uh, UAV surveys. So even for a, even for a you know a, let's say a, a you know a relatively poor third world country, a, a UAV is not a, is, is not a major expense. Um, uh, so so effectively, what we're trying to do, and one of the one of the things that we're trying to sort of say here is that our uh, our technology it is very it's very sophisticated technology but it's not expensive and and the whole idea is that we can try and share this out to uh, to as many as many countries and regions or as possible to help them deal with this problem because uh, as i say it's it's not um it's it's not often of their making but they are left left with it so we started with what we were doing um with a pretext of how can we help and and part of how can we help is how can we make it affordable to do and i think uh, that's what we that's what we that's where we're at but um you know it, everyone needs funding from someone you know the world bank or whoever and and that's that's where it all comes from but 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 ultimately if we if we can make it as accurate and as reliable and as instantaneous and as cheap as possible then it's a solution that that hopefully many many communities can take advantage of absolutely thank you simon i've got one more question here um it's from cromwell um who is one of our um task force committee members and i'll leave this open to um <coughs> pardon me sorry um perhaps to jamal do you think redesigning surveying systems should include adaptability in technology in times of service interruption such as internet disruption during climate crises and how are old tech uh, how can old technologies be relevant in those scenarios and happy for any of the other presenters to jump in on this one too after jamal Thanks, Roshni. Um, another interesting question, but of course, you know, um, I, I this is a brilliant question. Um, I, I haven't ever really gotten this one because, you know, we become so so desensitized to the need for ensuring adaptability that we keep forging ahead with the technology without considering the fact that technology can fail us as, as many of us have experienced in, in various instances. But but I do agree entirely. It's really important for us to 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 understand you know what some of the what some of the more basic applications are to ensure that we we ultimately get the work done. That is absolutely critical. Um, but at the same time, 
um, there are certain impediments to applying older technology, for example, levels of accuracy that are required in certain contexts. So for example, we know we can't apply certain old technology in the urban context. We cannot apply certain old technology um, for bathymetric surveys, for example. Um, and, and even as, let's say, for example, LIDAR technology diffuses itself into some you know, decision-making processes and, and decision makers become, you know, a bit more, a bit more dependent on that level of accuracy, that level of re reliability. The question then becomes: How reliable is are, are the methods that previously existed and 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 that 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 were previously applied? But I think it's a very important question, and it's really important for us to maintain um, um, the the you know, the, the importance and understand the importance and applicability of all the technology vis-a-vis -vis modern technology. So I think it's an important question, important consideration, but at the same time, there are questions as it pertains to reliability of data, um, the need for speed to ensure that, that we respond um, efficiently and, and, and quickly as well. But yeah, interesting question, something to think about. I probably need to give it some thought myself as well. And, you know, it's such a great point that you raised there, Jamal, in that one of the key roles of this task force is not only to provide answers and, and distribute knowledge, but to create the linkages between existing knowledges, but importantly, to ask questions that we may not have answers to right now, because climate and what is happening with the, uh, you know, with weather and climate at the moment is if we're operating in the, in the space of complexity and in the space of complexity, it's more important to ask questions that we don't have answers to than it is to have answers to the questions. So, um, you know, absolutely. Um, Roshi, could I, could I just say, jump in here please? as a, as a uh, seasoned surveyor, I think I alluded to it before, um, I would never go back in, in the circumstances, for example, of the earthquakes that we had in Christchurch, I would never go back to the old ways. Um, if we didn't have uh, GNSS, we were stuffed. You know, um, you could not turn angles because all your, you know, all your marks are gone, or all your marks have moved, and which is correct, and what's where's my orientation, where's my bearing. So, if as I said before, if we didn't have GNSS, we were you know that 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 was a real problem for us. So, um, yeah, some sometimes traditional stuff is okay, but uh, I think you know the stuff that comes out, you've got to you've got to trust it, and you've got to you've got to adapt it and use it for for the the the, the work that you do, um, disaster recovery, uh, all that sort of stuff. You know, so it's it's horses for courses. But um, and I and I appreciate that sometimes you might have to go back there, but you know why would you? You raised some really yeah, great points, Simon. Yeah, go down yeah, go for it. So I think it's a great question because uh, in the recent time we we uh, we are so dependent on the digital technologies on the internet on the Google Maps. When you are traveling, you will rarely see someone who will have paper map and trying to figure out how to get get somewhere. But um, I would say that uh, for for each solution there is uh, advantage, advantages and disadvantages and of course if we for example I, my example was for the floods and for uh, emergency response usually during the floods you will not have the internet but uh, maybe then uh, people can use it prior to the, to, to the flood to just get a better understanding. And also during the flood, you will not have either the, the paper maps. So I, so, uh, I think it is important to, to understand limitation and, and the great uh, question. And it is important also to have all this plan B and understand how uh, you can uh, distribute uh, information on efficient way, but uh, without using the uh, digital technologies that we are relying on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gordana. Those are, those are really, really excellent points. 
Um, now, I am conscious of time, so I would like to note that we have an excellent question again from Nathan Hazelwood, uh, for whom it's very late at night time in New Zealand at the moment. So I'll, I'll, I'll raise the question, but I'll leave it as a thinking point instead of answering it live, um, simply because I would like to uh, respectfully complete our webinar on time. So Nathan's question is that two industries where issues related to these topics are very important are the insurance industry and the finance industry. And so it's uh, interesting to think about what outre outreach should we be taking to ensure that those industries understand the capabilities of the modern technology and approaches that our industry can provide. So thank you very much for the question, um, Nathan. And what I would now like to do is to um, quickly let you know about the FIG Climate Compass Task Force in 2024. We have several really exciting things coming your way. First of all, we'll have the FIG Working Week in 2024 in Ghana. We'll have a radical and amazing climate masterclass that will cover a range of skills. You'll uh, learn hands-on skills as well as hear from experts from around the world and around Africa to be able to understand how we can be prepared as surveyors to create impact for the climate crisis. And we'll also have climate workshops during the technical program, as well as networking and social events for the task force while at the working week in Ghana. Uh, and we also have at least two webinars that we will run uh, virtually for anyone, whether they'd like to, no matter where in the world they're located. And we'll also have a task force meeting that will be run in, um, uh, uh, virtually so it'll be held on zoom again so we look forward to welcoming you to that um, and here we go so our task force meeting will occur in february 2024 and it will be run over the three major time zones that we have around the world so no matter where you are you'll be able to attend one of these in the morning and one of these in the evening we're aiming to make this as accessible as we can and we hope that you do register and join us for uh, as many of the, as of these as possible so details will uh, be available in the chat so please do register for those the other thing that I would like to um, uh, let you know about is that we have a mailing list and uh, our LinkedIn page that we do keep up to date. And if you would like to um, stay abreast of the latest developments of the Climate Compass Task Force, please do join our mailing list and follow us on LinkedIn. So all of the details about how to register for these three um, events that are part of our task force meeting and global virtual seminar will be made available to all of you via email. And you'll also be able to access the link to join our mailing list and follow us on LinkedIn in that email as well. Um, I'd like to just wrap up by saying a, a, a huge thank you to all of you who are online as attendees, because without you, we wouldn't have our global community. We wouldn't be able to ask questions and debate and have discussions about these important issues that are relevant to us as surveyors now more than ever. So thank you for joining us. We hope that you, um, we hope to see you at our task force meeting and global virtual seminar in February. And we hope that you've learned something about how um, climate is relevant to you as a surveyor in your day-to-day -day practice. So from Clarissa and I and the entire FIG Climate Compass Task Force Organizing Committee and our four speakers, thank you very much for joining us.